The two-phase locking mechanism of Teradata can result in a situation known as a deadlock. And deadlocking occurs when two transactions require access to a database object that the other transaction has already locked for each one to complete whatever it is their transaction needs to do. So we see transaction one acquire a lock and then wait for a lock that transaction two has already acquired and it's subsequently waiting for the original lock of transaction one. So neither one can proceed until they acquire the lock that the other one has. So they both end up waiting in a bit of a face-off for each one to release their locks, but they can't do so until they acquire the one that is held by the other. So a transaction will be in a waiting state until it can be granted the lock that it is requesting. But in a deadlock scenario, each transaction ends up in an infinite waiting state. So Teradata does support deadlock detection and resolution at two levels. The first is an AMP local level, simply known as a local deadlock. And this is contention between threads within one AMP. And it does check for deadlocks every 30 seconds. It literally just says, have any deadlocks occurred? The global level, known simply as a global deadlock, is contention between the threads of two or more AMPs. And the detection here is run at a user-defined interval. The deadlock timeout parameter can be set, and the default is four minutes. Now, when it comes to deadlocks, before you just, uh, you know, dismiss them and decide, oh, well, that was an isolated incident and will probably never happen again, you might actually want to gather some information. The viewpoint lock logger can be used to detect deadlocks manually. You can also use the XML plan output from DBQL logging. This enables deadlocks to be further investigated. But ultimately, you can also rely on the automatic detection that we just talked about. When deadlocks are detected, then Teradata will simply terminate the deadlock by rolling back the most recently initiated transaction of the two. One of those transactions very likely had to begin first. The chance that both of them were invoked at the exact same time, you know, right down to the microsecond or, you know, a very small time interval is pretty slim. So whichever one started first gets preference and it is allowed to complete. The other one is simply rolled back and you just have to request it again. And by that time, the original transaction should have completed, hence avoiding the deadlock a second time. Now, deadlocks can be minimized by specifying the locking request modifier for large or urgent transactions. And with this modifier, you can specify things like the no wait option, which is used to abort a transaction if the lock cannot be obtained. So if it flat out says, I can't get my lock, well, that's it. I'm not even going to try to process the transaction. I'll wait and try again. Uh, the locking row for write, this option is used when performing updates and selects within multiple transactions. So you want to make sure the updates happen before any kind of select occurs. And that ensures that the records are written and the locks are released before you then select those records. And you can also try adjusting the level, apply higher or lower severities of the lock than is actually required. This really comes down to understanding what is happening between the applications and the requests. If a particular transaction is locking an entire table, uh, when perhaps it should only be locking a few records, then of course you stand a greater chance of other transactions being blocked by that transaction. So you want to just ensure that the locks that are being acquired by a transaction are at the appropriate level for whatever it needs to do. If it only needs to lock a few records, that's what it should do. And that reduces the chance of other transactions interfering with or being interfered by the original transaction.